Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Jonathan, the assistant law librarian, and uh, this is going to be the Lexis class, uh, Pro Se Basics. Uh, this week we're talking about Lexis Advance. Uh, Lexis is uh, one of our primary databases uh, here at the law library, the other one being Lexis, the other one being Westlaw, excuse me. And we have several other uh, databases as well, but these are the two primaries that have uh, broad coverage and also have a lot of corollary in our printed materials. Uh, so I wanna talk just a little bit in general about Lexis and about uh, online legal databases, uh, just to kind of give a refresher uh, about what we have uh, and what Lexis has. Uh, of the two databases, both of them are excellent. Uh, Westlaw is probably a bit more prevalent than Lexis, though both are very prevalent, uh, especially in the academic side, both are uh, in law schools, of course, but you know, law firms and practitioners uh, and law libraries uh, use Westlaw and Lexis. Uh, we have both. We have Westlaw on four of our computers, Lexis on three of our computers. Obviously, with the current situation with COVID-19, our library is partially open, uh, partially closed in a manner of speaking, and we've had to uh, not turn on a few of our computers to facilitate social distancing. Uh, but two of our turned on computers have Lexis Advance, and I also uh, have access to it uh, through a, a separate password that we're granted. So I have access to it as well uh, from my computer, and so does our law librarian. So we can do a lot of work on, uh, on using it uh, without having to take up one of the patron computers. Uh, you know, Lexis has a full, our subscription is very broad, uh, you know, we have the full uh, panoply of, uh, of Texas resources, and, and law is generally divided into two categories uh, for purposes of, uh, of well, I guess, just describing them and what they are. One is uh, primary resources and one is secondary resources. Primary resources is the law. That's statutes, case law, uh, things of that nature, regulations, though it's, it's the, you know, the that's the pure law. Uh, case law as well is uh, a primary resource and that's opinions uh, by the courts of this country. Uh, and there's various levels of the courts. Obviously we're very familiar with the US Supreme Court. Uh, they have opinions. There's uh, opinions written by the federal courts of appeals. There's sometimes opinions written by federal district courts uh, and they're sort of a, precedence and importance of each of those, they work in relationship to each other. Uh, Texas and other states are the same way. State of Texas has a bifurcated highest court. The Texas Supreme Court is the highest civil court uh, handling, you know, civil matters such as, you know, personal injury and business cases and family law, uh, probate cases and so forth. And then there's a Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, which handles as uh, the highest court handling criminal uh, cases. Then between the trial courts, you know, some of which are here, obviously, in Fort Bend County, uh, and the highest courts are the courts of appeals, and those are regionalized courts in Texas. There's 14 of them, uh, and they uh, also issue opinions on legal issues when cases are appealed to them. So we have all those things are available on Lexis. We have the entirety of federal cases, the entirety of Texas cases. We also happen to have the entirety of every other state. So though it doesn't come up a lot, it doesn't cost us much more to get it. And so that's why we did. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it may come up that somebody needs case law from Georgia or the statutes from Georgia or Rhode Island or California or Oklahoma. And we have that. Uh, so we have the primary law on just about everything in the United States. Uh, secondary law, uh, that's the second category of things. And it's not law, secondary resources. And that's kind of everything else. And it's a lot of what we utilize here. Obviously, People need cases and statutes, especially attorneys, but everybody utilizes them. Uh, but then there's the secondary resources, and this is a lot of what we use with our pro se or self-represented uh, patrons. And those are uh, several things. Those are uh, treatises and practice guides, and those are invaluable resources about talking about the nuts and bolts and the details of the law, how you do things. And it's a way, I know when I'm dealing with pro se folks, it's a way that I I'm able to provide them information that tells them about a particular legal issue that they're dealing with. So let's say there is an issue of uh, modification of family law orders. 
couple was divorced, they have children, and uh, you know the divorce decree was entered and we're a year or two down the road and an issue has come up and there needs to be supposedly a modification of that order. Uh, I can provide information, it's kind of lawyer level uh, material, but it is information uh, about the modification process. What are some of the steps and requirements and, and law that's going to impact that? Uh, so it's really a, a, a great way to be able to provide people information. And I provide that same information to lawyers. They need it too. Uh, there's a heck of a lot of stuff out there. Uh, just one example of one of the primary resources, or excuse me, one of the secondary resources that we'll talk about uh, that is offered on Lexis is called Darcinio's Texas Litigation Guide. And it's an extensive practice guide on all manner of civil litigation. And in book form here at the Law Library, it's 26 volumes of binders. It's thousands of pages. And all that's also available on Lexis. Uh, and so it, it talks about all manner of things. Same, similar thing in Lexis, they have a family law practice guide. So we'll talk a little bit more in detail about those coming up. Uh, but those are some of the secondary resources we have. Another example of a secondary resource is a form. We have forms covering many things. There's not a form for everything, but there's a heck of a lot of them. And so when people say I need a particular type of motion or petition or something else, then, then you know, there's a good chance that we have it. Um, and Lexis provides a wide range of those, and they're often in, uh, come from those uh, practice guides, some of them that I've already mentioned. Uh, other things that are secondary resources are uh, law review articles and journals and so forth. And these are articles written by lawyers and law students and other folks uh, about issues in the law. So that's another secondary resource. And we have a full, uh, pretty much the full complement of uh, legal secondary resources available in this country. Uh, Texas, you know, the Texas Bar Journal, uh, the University of Texas Law Review, the University of Houston Law Review, the Texas Southern Law Review, uh, you know, all of those, and then many, many, many more, hundreds more. You know, uh, there's, there's probably 50 journals associated with Texas alone. So those are sort of, sort of the, the, the dividing line between those two types of resources. You know, we talked about secondary resources, uh, but the other states, we don't really have them for the other states. Our, our, our subscription is uh, sort of limited for the other states to the primary materials, but we do have secondary resources for the state of Texas, and that's, that's most of what we deal with here, our, our uh, patrons, our lawyers, and our self-represented uh, folks. So a big part of our budget, uh, it goes to uh, the maintenance of our collection, uh, both in print and online. We spend thousands and thousands of dollars each year. Uh, and that's obviously that's the main reason we're here is to provide legal materials. So we, we provide a deep, uh, for the size of the library we are, uh, we provide a really deep uh, uh, set of documents and books and uh, so forth, both in print and online. Obviously online, it's a heck of a lot easier to store it. You know, it, uh, it takes up a lot of space, but what we do have in print is, uh, I think, is very valuable, and I don't. I hope we never lose the print side. It, it makes it. They complement each other. It's great to be able to do uh, things online, but it's also good to be able to sit down with a book and look through it in that manner. Sometimes it's a. I know my brain works a little bit better sometimes in looking at something in book form uh, than looking at it online. So it's a. It's a complementary thing. Uh, I think some of the younger people are pretty much more focus solely on the computers and maybe some of the uh, old timers are focused really solely on the books. Uh, I feel like I, in, in my, when I practice law and in here as well, um, I kind of look at it from both perspectives and I, I, I see the, the good and value of both sides of it. Um, you know, talking about ease of use, uh, usability, Lexus, the, the online Lexus is great in that we can deliver the materials to you, to ourselves, and to our patrons uh, in many formats. Uh, if you do come into the law library, you can download documents to a thumb drive. You can print them for 10 cents a page. Uh, I can email them to you, or you can email them to yourself if you're here for free. So oftentimes, especially always really since I've been working at the law library, but obviously especially during these last few months when we've been essentially closed, uh, our interaction, you know, uh, over the phone and online with people and the ability to send them things. Somebody, you know, calls up or sends me an email or I meet them at the door uh, to talk with them and they say, hey, you know, I need some information in this regard. And 
I can take their email down and I can send it to them. I can send them the entire chapter on from one of the family law guides on, uh, you know, on modification. You know, I can send them. It's a maybe it's a 50 page document and I can send that to them. And it's, you know, it's a you know something maybe 250 kilobytes and I send it to them in word format and they have it. So it's just that the interface is excellent and makes it easy uh, and very user friendly. So it's pretty, pretty great thing. So let's talk a little bit about some of the nuts and bolts of Lexus Advance. I've kind of given my opening spiel. Uh, let's talk some about utilizing this platform. And I'm on the Lexus Advance page that you can see. And, you know, it's just like, uh, I'm not going to say just like, but, you know, using Lexus Advance or using Westlaw, you have a search bar. And it's kind of like Google. And, you know, you type in what you need and they come up with the results. Lexus, you know, has its way of presenting its results. And their search engines uh, are updated and, and, and modif you know, modified and, and modernized and so that they're very effective so that they bring back, uh, you know, what you search for is kind of what you get. I'm not saying it's perfect. Sometimes you got to dig a little deep. Uh, you know, maybe Lexus advances brain doesn't think the same as me sometimes and what I'd maybe put first in my results, but uh, it's, it's excellent really. Now, so I'm going to show you how to use this a bit uh, and hopefully uh, we will get back to normal someday and, uh, and have uh, folks coming back into the law library and using our resources in person. In the meantime, I'll be assisting you and Andrew and our other staff members. And uh, I'm going to give you some information. I can email, I'm going to email you. I have a kind of little handout that I do when I've done this class in person and I'll email it to you. And the last page uh, provides some information on establishing a temporary Lexus account in recognition of what's going on, Lexus and Westlaw as well have uh, set up kind of temporary accounts for people. It's somewhat limited. It lasts for like 30 days and the amount of documents you can download is somewhat limited, but it is something that can be used at home by you. And uh, hopefully it supplements or adds to the help that we can provide uh, during these circumstances. So let's look at Lexus Advance a little bit. Um, well, there's a couple of ways to start doing things. Sometimes people come in and they get on the Lexus page and here's the search bar and we can, uh, we can start searching. So I kind of, I was uh, noodling around a little bit and this is kind of the example I usually use. It's called a motion for continuance. Uh, so that's what I'm going to use as sort of our tool to explore Lexus. And, and, and when you search for something, what are the results? What does it bring up for you? And then how do you access them? So a continuance, uh, and I'm really kind of looking at it from the civil side of things, so I'm sure there's a corollary uh, in the criminal cases, but say if you have a case set for trial, and say you filed a case in, uh, you know, July of uh, 2019, and maybe the case was set for trial, has been set for trial in, you know, August of uh, 2020, and you're, you know, 30 or 40 days out, and, you know, you say, oh, man, you know, something's come up, or we need more time, or something like that. And so you need to ask the court for a continuance. Uh, obviously, there's rules uh, and law governing uh, continuance of asking the court to delay the trial, whether it's you know for a relatively short period of time or a substantial amount of time. And there's you know there's there's legal reasons for doing so and legal standards on how the court is can address this motion. So you need to go to the court and ask for a continuance to continue the case to another date. Uh, so you can type in your search term, a motion for a continuance and you choose, so you type that in there, and you can do things in various ways. This is kind of just a natural language search, um, you know, motion for continuance. Uh, you can do things, you can put quotes around things like, uh, like that to get only search for things that have that exact phrase in them. Uh, that's how you do that. There's things you can do to search called terms and connectors. So say if I wanted that exact phrase, uh, and then I also only wanted stuff that said, uh, and Texas. Uh, you can do terms and connectors uh, to add that category to things. So that exact phrase with the also anything brought up by Texas. Or maybe I'm looking to say I need motion for continuance and I don't know, let's just say uh, Fort Bend County. Uh, so I'm going to look for things to motion for continuance within the same paragraph as the term Fort Bend County. Maybe I'm looking for cases that expressly came out of, or exactly came out of Fort Bend County uh, on this issue. So you do the slash and then you say paragraph. So I want uh, to find the term motion for continuance uh, within the same paragraph as an uh, exact term Fort Bend County. 
do that. Or I can change this to a sentence. I want to find it in the same sentence. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of ways uh, you can, you know, filter your own results or, or actually change your own uh, search terms to get maybe more specifically defined things. Um, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to go back to my basic or a natural language search term motion for continuance. And I'm cho you know, chosen a court. You can choose, uh, I chose Texas, of course. I can choose federal stuff. I can choose as many of these as I want. Uh, obviously, I'm more interested in things in relationship to Texas. That's mostly what we do in here. Uh, but you can look in the federal system. You can look in every state. Uh, you can look in one particular state. So I'm going to choose Texas. I've chosen it. And I'm going to hit the search uh, button over here on the right. And it's come up with, over here in the upper left, you see the uh, results under particular types of categories. So it always lists cases at the top, but there's 9,721 cases that have been brought up. It's a big issue. It comes up a lot. Uh, you know, being, lawyers like anybody else sometimes procrastinate and they get to close to trial and they panic and they ask the court for a continuance. And so it's an issue that comes up <laughs> pretty substantially, obviously. Uh, obviously, it's not always about uh, procrastination. There's a, there's a, you know, good reasons as well. So it brings up uh, all these different types of results by category. Cases are listed first, then it lists statutes and legislation that have, uh, have this search term in them. Secondary materials, the things we we're talking about, such as the litigation guide, uh, brief pleadings and motions, or previously filed things in other cases, uh, forms. You know, so probably the, the, the three or four primary ones you'd look at would be case law, discussing the issue of motion for continuance, statutes and legislation, which would include uh, the rules of procedure, which there is one governing uh, that, or there's a few governing this issue. Uh, secondary materials, like I said, maybe you want to look at, you know, practice guides that talk about the real world, how it actually goes down, what, uh, you know, practice hints and pointers and information you need to know to, uh, you know, kind of handle this type of legal issue and forms. Uh, those are probably the primary things you're going to want to look at if you're searching on motion for continuance. Uh, but let's go to the, so it's going to list the cases first. And so then you have cases listed and you can sort them in various ways over here on the upper left where I'm circling. Uh, you can sort them in ways. So this is how uh, Lexis has sorted them by relevance. You know, they think based on my search term, this is the most relevant cases, Viegas versus Carter. Maybe, maybe not. But, uh, and then it just gives a list by relevance and so forth. Uh, or you can maybe choose by date, most recent. Uh, you can choose by court, uh, things of that nature. So you can, you can, you know, sort of filter your results or change your results uh, based on different categories, based on what you want to look at. Um, so, I mean, let's just look at a case. Uh, we'll go to Viegas versus Carter. And this is a case from a few years back, but it's from the Supreme Court. It's about 35, 34 years old. Uh, it's still good law. These things here, these uh, indicators here, various shapes and colors, uh, it has a yellow triangle next to it. That just means caution. Uh, so there's been some, uh, I don't want to get too much into detail about it, but I can, uh, cases since then have maybe taken some issue uh, with uh, maybe the court's reasoning, something like that. And obviously it's a relatively old case and, and, uh, and so maybe some things have changed since then. It's still a, a valid case, but there might, might not be the best case to, to uh, cite anymore. So you need to look at, you know, some things possibly, you know, why there is a caution there, but uh, other citing references have been positive uh, in, in their analysis of the Supreme Court's uh, opinion. And it's been cited 432 times in subsequent opinions by either the Supreme Court or the courts of appeals. So, and then you get in this, and then the cases are presented here. It gives the information about the case. Uh, it gives kind of a summary and so forth at the beginning. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's see what they talk about. So that, let's, you know, you jump to the outcome. And this is, this prefatory stuff here is not the law. This is the publisher's comments on it. You know, they have a legal staff, they have attorneys that read through these opinions and come up with these overviews and so forth. But you don't get to the actual case until you scroll down. But you kind of get a hint of it here. Uh, talking about the court held that the trial court abused its discretion 
when it allowed the petitioner's counsel to withdraw two days before trial and then also denied their motion for a continuance to obtain new counsel. And that kind of goes to, I'm just as my knowledge of motion for continuances as I dealt with them many times in, in my career is in general, the standard that the court is under in reviewing a motion for continuance or, or actually in judging a motion for continuance at the trial court level is abuse of discretion. So the court has a lot of discretion in, uh, you know, their, their management of their court and, and the management of their docket and the moving of cases towards trial. And so uh, generally a trial court's ruling is not going to be uh, overturned unless it can be shown that uh, in making their decision on the continuance, either to grant it or deny it, uh, they abuse their discretion, you know, that they went outside uh, the proper guidelines and so forth uh, in doing so. So it's a pretty high burden you got to reach, uh, you know, uh, the court kind of has to you know, kind of screw up uh, to get into the abuse of discretion type thing. So you got these headers on particular types of uh, topics within it. You can jump to it. It describes, you know, each case kind of has some, you know, main points of law that they discuss. And that's what these head notes uh, describe. But it doesn't get down to the actual what the court actually said until you get to the opinion side of things. And this is, you know, this is the first word that the court said. So this is the law. This is an example of primary law. You know, this case involves the trial court's discretion. So this is the trial court's opinion and so forth. So that's case law. Uh, and then other things, of course, are brought up by uh, doing this type of search. So we also, let's say, want to look at statutes and legislation. And I kind of looked through here a little earlier just to I always refresh myself a little bit before I teach a class and, and see what's new and uh, you hate to get into the middle of a class and look like you don't know what you're talking about. So, you know, I, I would disagree maybe with how they uh, uh, categorize things uh, as far as relevance goes, uh, as far as what they've listed, because there's 601 uh, items that were brought up by this type of search in the statutes and legislation. Uh, and for whatever reason, they see fit to list as the most relevant document uh, something from uh, Gregg County, uh, some of their local rules about continuances. You know, and then they have you know Travis County's local rules about continuances and so forth. So it took going through a couple of pages, uh, and you can refine your search to get to exactly what you want. But I used a you know somewhat broad terminology, but it took a few pages to get to what I thought should be. Uh, the number one uh, item listed. Let me see if I can get there. Uh, I think it's page three of the results. But you'll see there's 61 pages of results. There's 10 items per page, so there's you know 600 plus uh, items. So going on to page three, let's see here, rule 251. Uh, and this is, and we'll click on this, this is one of the rules from the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, which are the statewide rules uh, you know, passed by the legislature that uh, govern a lot of the you know, procedures in civil courts. Uh, and, and so they're, they're obviously key, uh, you know, they're key parts of uh, your analysis of your motion for continuance and have a lot of relevance to uh, bringing such a motion and the standards and so forth of how they'll be judged and uh, that sort of thing. So rule 251 is one of the rules. I go up here to the top kind of working backwards. This is one of the rules. I'm gonna go back to kind of the sub chapter in the rules that covers continuance and change of venue because there's a few more rules about it. Uh, this is the, the, these are the rules uh, covering continuance. Um, this is kind of the main one, application for continuance, and continuance. Uh, but then there's some of the things that govern the courts. So attendance in the legislature. If your lawyer happens to also be a member of the legislature and they're in session, uh, that's a pretty much an automatic out uh, for uh, a continuance. It definitely will probably lead to the continuance having to be granted. Uh, absence of counsel, if your lawyer is somehow gone, uh, they're ill or some other reason, that's another one. So there's other good cause as well. I mean, application for continuance, I think it talks about, you know, good cause shown. Uh, some of the standards uh, that, that you're going to uh, – bring forward. I think generally continuances have to be sworn to, uh, meaning you have to do kind of a little affidavit or verification of it that the things you're stating in the application, the motion for continuance are uh, true. Uh, so bear that in mind as well. But it's just one example, not to get too deep into that topic, uh, you know, the things that are brought up by a search on 
Lexus. Uh, let's go back to some other categories then. So in addition to statutes and legislation, uh, forms. Let's go, that's oftentimes what people are looking for. Hey, I need a form that I can utilize. Uh, and so here, and it's from one of the secondary resources because within the Texas Litigation Guide, uh, in addition to information, they have sample forms for things. So let's go look at the motion for continuance here that was brought up in the search term. It's a general form. And it just, you know, it gives kind of a template. Um, and it has to be, you would probably have to edit it. It gives various options and so forth. And you need to, if you use this form, you would have to uh, make it case specific, uh, go through it carefully, edit it and so forth. Uh, but it's a great way to start. It's a, you know, uh, why reinvent the wheel when you have kind of a standard form here uh, that can be used and, and, and edited to fit your needs. Uh, and this is, I'll kind of, this takes us to another, deal about how <clears throat> uh, the user-friendly side of things. So I said, ooh, I wanna use this uh, form. Uh, so I can, I can do a few things. I can uh, email it to myself. I'm say, okay, I wanna work on this later, so I'll email this to myself. And you, it's, it defaults to me since I'm here on my account, but you type in your uh, email address here uh, on the uh, two, uh, and then you choose how you want it delivered to you. Uh, most people probably use Microsoft Word, but you can send it in PDF form or Word perfect, uh, and then you hit uh, submit, and it'll send it to you in Word format. Uh, pretty handy, and it's free. There's other ways, there's other options, of course. Uh, if you were here at the law library and you say, well, I just wanna start working on this thing right now, uh, you can hit the download button, and you hit download, and it open uh, the document in Word right here on the computer. Uh, I don't wanna do that because it kinda messes up the screen sharing thing, and. I'm not the, I'm not the uh, expert yet at Zoom. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so there's, diff there's just different ways of uh, delivering it to yourself. Obviously you can download it and also then save it to a thumb drive uh, here as well. You can print it if you wanted to. Uh, kind of more relevant if you maybe have the case that you wanted to print. Uh, yeah, so there's just, and then let's look at secondary resources just to show the sort of final primary category of, uh, of things that are brought out by that search. So a lot of secondary resources and you just kind of have to scroll through and look for things. You know, here we have a motion for continuance, you know, from the Texas litigation guide and it's also where that form was, you know, and there's uh, law review articles talking about it. This looks like one of the main chapters from Darsenio's Texas litigation guide. So let's open up that one. And then it just, this gives sort of information, you know, this uh, sort of where the rubber meets the road type of thing. Like I said, where, how does the real world work? You know, I know I hear the rules and I see the forms and the statutes and cases, but you know, let's just, you know, how, how do I do this? And uh, for a person who's unfamiliar with the law, I think these things are uh, indispensable uh, for lawyers as well. Uh, lawyers, there's a lot of different things to know and sometimes you might not deal with stuff on a regular basis. Uh, and so, you know, it's valuable to read, to. Uh, give you the lay of the land on how things uh, work. So, and there's again, this thing, I could send you this, uh, this document via email if need be. Uh, I do it every day. So let's look at a, let's go back and look at the main page. We only got about uh, seven or eight minutes left. Um, let me jump to, well, let me just go back actually. So this shows you, if you want to just get back to the main page, you just go up here on the upper left hand corner and hit the Lexus advanced button. And we go to the home page essentially. So then in addition to searching for things, you know, using the search terms, you can just maybe jump right in and go to some other different categories of things. You know, you want to jump to statutes and litigation legislation, which uh, includes the Texas rules of civil procedures in that, uh, or you want to go straight to the secondary materials. So let's, let's go to the secondary materials because I kind of want to introduce you, if you don't know already, to the secondary materials that are available. And, and I, you know, Westlaw and Lexus are both excellent. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of overlap in what they cover, obviously the cases and so forth. They're presented in their own particular formats, but, uh, but where there's some differences um, and where there's some differences uh, is in the secondary resources. And I think uh, Lexus, they acquired a company called Matthew Bender a number of years back. And Matthew Bender is the publisher, you know, of books who 
publishes things such as the litigation guide or the family law practice and procedure manual here or the Texas estate planning uh, deal. So, and these are excellent in-depth resources that provide information and forms on just all these topics of the law. You know, I had a gentleman uh, come by yesterday and, you know, he'd lost uh, his case and he was thinking, you know, about options after losing his case. And uh, so there's some things you can maybe do like file an appeal, uh, things like that. So I, I provided him some information from the Texas litigation guide in that regard. Now appeals, it's a broad topic. So I, you know, I sort of put together uh, some resources that provide him some, you know, good introductory information to appeals so that he could weigh his options on what to do. Uh, and so I was able to send that to him. And so that's just kind of one example of things. So there's just, there's a, and not to ignore the criminal side of things, I've been concentrating on civil, but you know, there's some excellent uh, secondary resources that I send materials to lawyers and lawyers use them here as well. Obviously we have them in print mostly too. You know, the Texas Criminal Lawyers Handbook, Texas Criminal Practice Guide, Texas Drunk Driving Law, you know, Texas DWI manuals, you know, just provides a lot of uh, meat and potatoes information and forms, uh, on, you know, covering all manner of topics. I was sending some stuff yesterday to an attorney who, who comes in here regularly. You know, he just needed some information about issues related to uh, uh, plea bargains uh, and so forth. So I, I sent him some stuff on that. Uh, so let's just take a quick look at the Darsenio's Texas Litigation Guide, because it's kind of the one I've mentioned a bit. Uh, let's, uh, if I can get it to open. No, all right, it's not open. Let me see. No, let me go. Let me go. I'll, I'll skip uh, Darsenio's Texas Litigation Guide, and I'll go to one that I use quite a bit. I clicked on Texas Family Law Practice and Procedure. You know, a lot of the people that we uh, work with here on the pro se side, people representing themselves, it's family law. You know, it's a, it's a big part of what goes on here at the courthouse. There's three courts and six judges, and that's all they deal with is family law. And it's often an ongoing thing. There's people here working on family law cases that, you know, you look at the cause number and it's, uh, you know, 10 years ago that they were granted a divorce and they still come back from time to time to have to deal with stuff. It's Sometimes it's just fine, but sometimes it's unfortunate circumstances, you know parties and people not treating each other well and uh, messing with each other. So anyway, uh, so this is a, I provide materials from this to people. Uh, and they can also look at the books and look at this on the computer as well. But there's just various uh, subtopics uh, or topics. And then you, uh, there's sort of subtopics to these. So, you know, initiating action for dissolution of marriage. Now that's about, that's divorce. That's what the fancy name for divorce. So you expand the menu here, hit that plus, and it expands the menu to subcategories and subtopics in uh, divorce. And so then you can expand on those, you know, drafting the petition, uh, the SAPSR term, that SAPCR thing here, that's called suit affecting parent child relationship. And that's just a, a general term that's used in relationship to any um, case that involves children. Uh, suit of, you know, divorce just between two people with no kids, that's not a suit affecting parent-child relationship. But a divorce where there's minor children involved, that is a suit affecting parent-child relationship. So then you expand this menu to look at things. And there's subcategories of things presented here under this topic. There's a practice guide. Uh, you expand that menu and there's various topics to deal with uh, and so forth. And you can open those up. You can send them to yourself um, using the email functions and such. Then there's forms, you know, so they have uh, petitions and the petition is a document that starts uh, the uh, divorce lawsuit. And there's just, you know, there's a sample petition uh, and there's uh, various categories of uh, things that can be added to uh, the petition. So like I said, I mean, that's just one sub chapter uh, in this extensive practice guide. Uh, you know, it covers everything, you know, post-divorce, you know, enforcing the child support decree here, Objective J, uh, you know, yeah, that happens. Uh, people aren't uh, doing what they're supposed to do in relationship to child support, and the parent who's entitled to receive child support has to come back to the court and, uh, you know, put their feet to the fire. So that's uh, secondary resources. Let's go back to the main menu. We've just got a few minutes left. Um, 
you know, there's other stuff in here. I kind of tried to hit what I regard as the, you know, the, the primary stuff, the most useful things. There's obviously some other things as well. There's a separate forms category. I usually go at seeking forms just because I'm a little more familiar with it by going to the secondary materials, looking for the particular topic and then seeing what forms are in there. Uh, but you can also go straight to the forms as well. So there's, you can look at things, you know, by content, what kind of, this is the content that Lexis Advance provides. Um, you know, also under secondary materials is the law reviews and journals side of things. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's not the most used thing uh, we have here, but uh, you know, they have their value for sure. And uh, some of them are very valuable, but uh, they put the, all the Texas ones up here for us is just how we have our page organized. So uh, you can look, you know, here's all the various journals, the Texas Bar Journal, which is a general uh, kind of mag monthly magazine for uh, members of the uh, of bar, the attorneys. But then you got the uh, Texas A&M Law Review, which is not in College Station. Texas A&M uh, affiliated a few years ago with what used to be called Texas Wesleyan law school in Fort Worth, which is a law school that's only been around for about 30 or so years, uh, but they affiliated with them a few years ago. So it's now called uh, Texas A&M Law School and it's in downtown Fort Worth. Uh, but then you have some other things, you know, the Baylor Law Review, uh, you know, you have the Texas Law Review. So it's, uh, yeah, those are just another example of a secondary resource. Let's go back to the main page again. Uh, and you can look through all the states. You can, you know, for some reason you want the Kentucky Bar Journal, uh, have at it. Um, well, I think that's kind of the, the main thing. Let me look at my notes a little bit just to make sure I haven't skipped anything uh, that would be, um, think would be real important. But like I said, Lexis to me is just a fantastic resource. I use it every day. Uh, honestly, I'm, I'm Westlaw I use every day as well. But if I had to pick one or the other between Lexis and Westlaw, I'd pick Lexis. Um, it's, they're both excellent and we get good support from uh, both of the people who work for Lexis and Westlaw, but if I had to choose, uh, I would choose Lexis. So uh, does uh, anybody have any questions? Uh, you're welcome to ask them in the chat or uh, you're just, you're welcome to unmute if you want to, uh, please do. Let's see. Well, uh, there being no questions, I appreciate y'all uh, um, attending the class, and I'll send you my little uh, my little handout that gives you a bit of information and gives you the info on signing up for uh, the the free Lexus trial and so forth, and it'll just give you some more information. And like I said, if you ever you know I have my contact info too, uh, so if you ever need anything uh, from Lexus or uh, anything else, just feel free to contact me. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll be emailing you so you'll have my email and my phone number and so forth. So uh, thank you all for attending and we'll see you at the next class. Thanks. Mm -hmm.